Good evening. Welcome back to the fourth season of Research Alive. The public face of the Schulich School of Music of McGill University has consisted of, in large majority, majority, performances by our talented faculty and student musicians, at times performing works by our own composers. These performances, 700 plus a year, provide a great glimpse into the talent at the school, yet are only a part of what makes the School of Music such a, a unique and interesting institute of higher learning. The Research Alive series was founded by Professor Stephen McAdams and myself, a PhD student in composition, with the aim to bring alive and to share with the public the research taking place within the school's two departments of music performance and music research, from the areas of music theory, music history and musicology, music education, sound recording, musical science and engineering, performance and composition. So in a talk uh, today titled, Who's on First? Interpreting Thematic Relationships in a Brahms Sonata for Clarinet and Piano, this Research Alive presentation uh, will feature the dynamic presenter-performer duo of Nicole Biamonte and Edward Clorman, both music theory professors here at the Schulich School of Music. They'll be discussing the challenge of how performers can effectively translate a written score into a musical dialogue. In this presentation, the audience will experience in real time how the analysis of a musical score can enrich performance, explored through a movement of Brahms' first clarinet sonata, which will be performed live at the end of the presentation. Dr. Nicole Biamonte has studied music theory, piano, and choral conducting. Before coming to McGill, she taught at Yale University, Skidmore College, the University of Texas at San Antonio, and the University of Iowa. Dr. Biamonte's primary research area concerns the theory and analysis of popular music with a focus on rhythmic and metric functions in rock music. She's also interested in form and harmony in popular music, music theory pedagogy, and musical, and musical historicism in the 19th century, which was the top of, uh, topic of her dissertation. Dr. Edward Clorman is a music theorist specializing in tonal music and in, and in the relationship between analysis and performance. His first book, Mozart's Music of Friends, Social Interplay in the Chamber Works, draws on historical concepts of musical social, social ability and agency to develop new approaches to the analysis of sonata form and phrase rhythm. He has published and presented widely on topics in the performance of 18th century chamber music. He currently serves as co-chair of the Performance and Analysis Interest Group of the Society, of Music, Society for Music Theory. Prior to his appointment at the Schulich School of Music at McGill University, he previously taught music theory, viola, and chamber music at the Juilliard School, uh, Manhattan School of Music, and Queens College. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professors Nicole Biamonte and Edward Clarman. Very pleased to be here, and uh, we are colleagues in the music theory area here at the Schulich School of Music, but we are also performers. Ed is a violist, and I'm a pianist. We're available for parties. <laughs> <laughs> and today we're going to be wearing both of those hats, so we will talk about how music analysis can uh, inform our performance of this Brahms sonata and uh, explore the relationships between uh, thinking about the structure of the music and taking apart and putting it back together again. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good. All right. <laughs> uh, which uh, belongs with this slide. Uh, so we'll be showing uh, essentially the way that the themes in this sonata uh, work together and have a lot of interplay, a lot of dialogue. This sonata is especially fun for me to play because I'm more of an equal partner than the pianist usually is. But we'll start with some historical context. So up on the screen is a list of every chamber music, uh, piece of chamber music that Brahms published and the date it was published. As you can see, chamber music was very, very important to Brahms. He wrote many of these pieces for particular friends of his to play, particular dedicatees, and they're often inspired by those musicians. And we put a line toward the bottom of the screen um, what I want to indicate there is that after Brahms wrote his Opus 111 string quintet, he felt he was done. He wrote a letter to his publisher saying, I will send you nothing else, please draw up my will, and uh, no more composing for me. But that didn't last long uh, because he was inspired uh, after this by a particular clarinetist. The clarinetist was by the name of Richard Milfeld, 
we actually have a picture of him. He was the solo clarinetist of the Meiningen Orchestra. And his playing was so inspiring to Brahms that Brahms decided to write a few more last pieces for him. And so you see his last few pieces of chamber music all featured the clarinet, the clarinet trio, the clarinet quintet, and then two sonatas for clarinet. Now, this is not a clarinet, but I should explain. Uh, there's a tradition, um, historically, a lot of pieces written featuring the clarinet were also published in alternate versions for viola or for violin, since those were instruments that more people played. Uh, so um, this is really, these are clarinet sonatas. They're part of these last four special clarinet pieces that are some of the last pieces Brahms wrote. Uh, but you can play them on viola, I hope to demonstrate today. Um, and uh, after he wrote these two sonatas for clarinet and piano, he just wrote two more pieces, uh, one of which is four serious songs based on the Old Testament, songs about mortality and about death. And then after that, he wrote these chorale preludes that he wanted to be published, uh, at, po published posthumously. So one gets the sense, you know, not with every composer do we know when they were writing their last few pieces, did they know that this is their late style? Did they know this will be my last piece in sonata form, my last piece of chamber music? But for Brahms, you sort of get the sense that he thought of this as sort of his final word, the coda or the afterlife to his compositional career. Just wanted to show you, this is a little bit about the uh, transcription for viola. The story is Brahms' publisher, Simrock, wrote to him saying, are you going to make a viola version of these sonatas, or are we going to have to? Because we will hire someone to do it if you don't get around to it. And this got Brahms to make the transcription, which he said was very difficult. He wasn't sure he successfully uh, made the piece into a viola version. But what you have here on this slide, uh, Brahms' publisher hired a copyist to write out the clarinet part in the correct clef, in the correct key for viola. Up here, this word bratsche, that's the fancy German word for viola. And Brahms went through, and everywhere where the clarinet part went too high, or had something that would be difficult to do on viola, he made little adjustments. So here you can see this is taken down an octave. Or here, this spot, which is an octave too low, he added some grace notes to kind of give it a little energy to compensate for being in a different register on viola. Some violas today actually play the clarinet version or play a hybrid of Brahms' clarinet and viola versions. I actually did play the clarinet for two years in middle school, but I think you will much prefer the performance day on viola <laughs> to clarinet. Um, and just want to connect this piece then with the theme of lateness in Brahms. Many, many uh, authors about Brahms and also performers have engaged this topic of what is late style? Is there something different about this music, something nostalgic, uh, reflective? Uh, Brahms was a composer who was very interested in who he considered to be the great masters who came before him in the Renaissance, in the Baroque, in the classic. He's said to have stated, who could write a symphony after Beethoven? Um, so um, is that part of what's going on in his late style? In German, there's this fancy term, Todesangst, which means literally death anxiety, or to put it more in English, consciousness of your mortality. Um, is that something we hear a little bit uh, connected into these pieces, a sense of struggle, um, a connection with the past, maybe concerns about the future of music uh, after Brahms is perhaps something we can hear in some of these pieces. And now we'll take a quick tour of the main themes in the piece and the ways that they interact. So first I have an overview. This uh, is a sonata. We're playing the first movement of it, which is in a form that falls into three parts. The first part, the exposition, presents the themes. There's usually more than one theme. Most often there are two themes that are in contrasting keys and have contrasting characters. Uh, Brahms gives, gives us a freebie. You can see here there's a main theme, a lyrical theme, and a third theme, an agitato theme. Uh, then the middle section, the development, takes those themes and those keys and puts them in the blender. Uh, and it's usually quite chaotic uh, section. And then the recapitulation, everything is resolved again. The themes are presented again in the same order, but now they've been reconciled and they're all in the same key. So, so there's this sense really of coming home, one might say. Um, I made this slide partly to provide this overview of the form, but also to show how much uh, trading off of these themes there is between the viola and the piano. So we start with a brief introduction played just in the piano. The viola plays the main theme. This arrow represents some transitional music. Uh, and then the piano plays the main theme. 
Then the lyrical theme, the piano starts and the viola has a counter melody and then immediately we trade positions. So the lyrical theme is repeated with the viola beginning and then the pianist playing the counter melody. The agitato theme we play together with the viola leading, the closing theme we play together with the piano leading. In the development section, there's not really one convention for which theme gets put into the blender first. In this instance, it's the lyrical theme, and it starts out retaining its lyrical character uh, in piano and viola as in the exposition. Then the viola takes it over and puts it in a new and very distant key. So hopefully you'll hear how Brahms kind of pulls the harmonic rug out from under us there. And then you can see the lyrical theme and agitato theme are combined and the lyrical theme takes on some of that agitated and restless character of the agitato theme, and then the agitato theme takes over. The final section represents the themes that we heard in the first section. The introduction does not always recur, although in this instance it does, and in kind of a drastically wrong key, which we'll talk about. Uh, the main theme happens much, not entirely as it did at the beginning. What doesn't happen is that I don't get to repeat it. But as compensation, when we get to the agitato theme, I get to play it all by myself. And then we finish by playing the closing theme, and then finally a coda that's kind of new material that's serene and reflective and maybe retrospective, again, looking backwards over uh, the things that we've heard in the rest of the piece up to this point. To Nicole's point about the back and forth between the instruments, this is not at all a piece for clarinet with piano accompaniment or viola with piano accompaniment. In fact, Brahms called these sonatas for piano and clarinet. So he really saw them as equal partners in the interplay, the give and take between the two instruments, the way they respond to one another or enhance what one another played was really, really very important to him. So we are going to show uh, some excerpts from the score. If you don't read music, you're still going to be able to follow because we're going to play everything and demonstrate everything. And I've added a lot of annotations and arrows. So even if you can't actually read the notes, you can still see the patterns and the relationships that they make on the page. So to begin with the piano introduction, um, sounds like this. What's interesting about the way I hand off that to the main theme is, uh, is that there's some overlap. Normally, I would play the introduction and I would finish here and then the main theme would come in. Or maybe I would finish my introduction at the moment that the viola plays the main theme. But as you can see by this arrow here, I don't actually get to play my last note until the viola's already begun the new melody of the main theme. I'm not patient enough to wait for her to finish. <laughs> Uh, the technical term for this is formal elision, and it's a very common technique in Brahms. He does it more often later in pieces than at the beginning, but this is a nice example. So here's what that sounds like. The structure of the main theme is built around essentially the harmonic building block of music, uh, the triad. It's essentially just a descending triad in minor. Mm. But then we repeat that idea, and the viola gives it a little bit of ornamentation. You can see there's a bit of back and forth here between these notes, making the theme a little bit more interesting and a little bit more decorated. <laughs> So the theme gets intensified just as he plays it from the very opening bar uh, here, moving into this repetition of the motive. And then there's some connecting music. And then when I play the theme, I begin with that ornamented version. You can see here's the back and forth. And then uh, when I get to the repeat of that idea, I ornament it even more. So you can see there are additional notes here. And that sounds like that should we play? Yeah, let's play your theme with the accompaniment. Okay. And then my version of the theme intensifies that.
Then the lyrical theme, which is contrasting key, contrasting character, so it's much softer, it's sweeter, it's in a major key, is begun by the piano. And uh, I have what's not really the most interesting melody, although we'll talk in a little bit about where that comes from. It's just a little bit of a descending scale. Yeah, na, na. And then the viola plays this uh, little counter melody instead that moves by leap and goes upwards. So it's contrasting uh, both in its direction and its shape. And that sounds like this. And then once we get to the end of that, it repeats immediately and we trade rolls immediately. So the viola plays the descending scalar melody, which sounds like this. And then I play the ascending counter melody with leaps. Then when we get to the agitato theme, our parts move even closer together. So here we have a small motive that just takes up one bar that we alternate immediately. So viola, piano, viola, piano. It's kind of a statement response, statement response, back and forth. It sounds really like a, a fast conversation in real time. One would think that maybe those alternating one bar units are quite close already, but we get even closer shortly after that. Uh, and we use a technique called canon, in which the piano plays a melody that the viola imitates immediately, so overlapping before I finished. Uh, and what I play, as you can see from the notes with the red arrows, is just a little descending scale fragment, and then I play another version of it starting slightly lower. So that sounds like this. Now, let's play that with the viola imitation. I always feel like here, because I'm descending when she leaps above me, and then when she's descending, I leap above her. I feel like I'm listening to, you know, those old-fashioned barber poles, or like a kaleidoscope. That's sort of the effect I get in this pat, uh, spot with these lines swirling down. Once again, we have a theme that's really just a scale, but Brahms combines it in a way that makes it really very intense and, and original. So shall we play? Shall yeah. we play the whole? What makes the barber pole even more interesting and exciting is that I also have all of this accompaniment material uh, going on in between. So now we'll play that whole uh, texture. <laughs> And now, the story of G flat. There's a school of thought that sometimes in some pieces of music, there's a certain note early on in the piece that somehow doesn't belong. It's a note that's unexpected, and it's a note that sort of hovers over the piece, or infects the piece, or becomes a problem that the piece needs to overcome in order to reach its conclusion. This is just that sort of piece. So let's take a look at the way the piece opens. First thing, we mentioned before how it opens with just the piano alone and the piano playing a melody with no accompaniment. So that's already strange. Uh, could you just remind us how that melody goes? Sure. So it's in bare octaves. It's very stark. There's no harmonic accompaniment. And uh, Brahms actually also does this in a much earlier piece in F minor, his piano quintet. Mm -hmm. But overall, in introductions, it's an unusual thing to do because at the beginning of the piece, you want to establish the key. And the best way to do that is to use some harmony. And here, we don't really get any very clear cues as to what the key is. It's a little bit unclear and mysterious. So that sounds like this. Now, if I had composed the piece, and I'm not quite as inventive as Brahms, I would have ended that just a little bit differently. Here's a different way that might have ended. Right, so this uses, as you can see from the slide, mysterious note not in the key of G flat. So this piece is in F minor, and G flat does not belong to that key. It's an outside note. So if the introduction were in F minor, without using any mysterious notes, it would sound like this.
That'd be very normal. The opening doesn't have harmony, but by the time it finishes, you can sort of tell what the tonic, what key the piece is in, because that establishes F minor. The problem is the way Brahms actually wrote it, he ends with this G flat that we're talking about. Right, and he saves it for almost the end of the melody, and then the note that resolves it, that clarifies things, happens underneath the viola beginning the new theme. So uh, the role of G flat stays a little bit mysterious. People who already know something about music theory will recognize this as an inflection of the Phrygian mode, a very ancient scale that was used in earlier music from the Renaissance and uh, early Baroque. And Brahms was very fond of older music. We'll talk about, more about that as well. Then I come in with F minor. So it sort of clarifies the key, but uh, one's left wondering, well, what about this G flat? I mentioned the idea that this mysterious G flat becomes a problem, a pervasive problem throughout the piece. And we can see that already in the harmonization of the first theme. So in the introduction, we had G flat as just a note. But in the harmonies that accompany the theme, we get G flat now becoming a harmony. Here's the harmonization of the first theme. <laughs> Then we mentioned that there's this lyrical uh, sort of second theme. That second theme is composed in an interesting way because Brahms takes music from that introduction and repurposes it and reuses it to build this lyrical second theme. Let me explain what I mean. Can we hear just the melody, the top part of the lyrical theme? So those same notes, A flat, G flat, F, are the three notes that came from the end of the piano introduction. That's the melody of the lyrical theme comes from that introduction. But then Brahms very cleverly counterpoints that melody against a bass, which is based on the beginning of the introduction. So could we hear just the bass and then hear them together? Sure. Uh, just to remind you, the beginning of the introduction starts like that. And then here's the bass line to the lyrical theme. And then here are those things together. So in a way, this lyrical theme isn't really a new theme at all. It's a repurposing of, or a summary of, or a reflection on that introduction that opened the piece. Um, this particular way of combining these two voices where there's this alternation, bass, melody, bass, melody, where they're out of sync, or in music we sometimes say they're syncopated, it might remind some of you of something called fourth species counterpoint, which is a technique composers use to learn how to write voices against one another in syncopations. The last thing to say about this is this bass line is really um, obsessed with the note G flat. It's mostly moving in quarter notes, but then it gets stuck on G flat a couple times. We could hear it once more and notice those G flats. G flat, G flat again. It's almost like Brahms is asking us, G flat didn't quite fit in the opening of the piece. Maybe if I go to a different key, could I find a place where G flat fits better? Is that a solution to the problem from the opening of the piece? Then um, this same idea of counterpointing the, uh, the opening of the introduction against the closing of the introduction in those syncopations, that's what a lot of the uh, development is based on. Only Brahms sort of ramps up the intensity by making things in a minor key and by making them happen twice as fast. So um, we'll take this, there's one other element here I'll get to in a second, but let's start with just the bass and the melody. You'll hear that same syncopation. You'll hear the bass, da di da da, against the in the melody. So that's already intense enough, but then to make things even more intense, Brahms adds another idea in the piano's right hand. Can we hear that idea? And that idea is based on the agitato motive. Remember that motive? Or whichever key it's in. Um, 
That motive is the thing that Nicole's going to play in her right hand. We put it all together. It's quite intense. We have the syncopation between bass and melody, and then the agitato motive stuck in the middle. So this is where Brahms gets a lot of his material for the development uh, in some kind of intense moments in the development. And then a climax comes toward the end of the development as we're getting back into the recapitulation. So just to explain, in many pieces of music, we mentioned the development is wild, it can go lots of different places, but it's, a, it's an important idea that to get to the recapitulation, it's like returning home. We want to come back to the original key that the piece started in. In this piece, this causes a moment of crisis because instead of ending up in F minor, we end up in the key of F sharp minor. Now that might sound very close, it's just a half step off, but in musical terms, that's actually a very distant place to be. It's very hard to get from F sharp to F. Now, what's so important about F sharp, I will demonstrate. I will ask Nicole, could you please play for me in F sharp? And now just to compare, could we hear a G flat? So you will notice that these are two different names for essentially the same pitch in the piano. In other words, the G flat, the mysterious G flat from the opening has now come back in its nefarious guise as an F sharp and threatens to throw the whole sonata off track. So to demonstrate this for you, here's just to remind you the key of the opening of the piece. So in the key of F, here's what this section would sound like if it were in the right key in the key of F. But instead, it's in the key. So this is the moment where the problematic G flat or F sharp really causes a great crisis for this piece. And uh, just to point out, this music we're hearing here is based on the introduction from, to the whole piece. So we heard that music in F minor at the beginning to introduce the exposition. Now we're hearing it problematically in F sharp to introduce the development. Brahms was very interested in counterpoint. We've already talked about the ways in which he combines themes, which is an example of counterpoint. Counterpoint comes from the Latin punctus contra punctum, which means note against note. So when we say counterpoint, we mean there's more than one melody going on at the same time, usually more than one rhythm going on at the same time as well. And really the pinnacle of working with counterpoint is what we sometimes refer to as musical form, but it's really more of a process called fugue. And so Brahms uses some aspects of fugue in this work as well. First, I will explain the idea of a fugue, as many of you probably already know, starts with a motive called the subject, and that's presented in one voice, all alone, all by itself. And then another voice comes in with a version of that same motive that's called the answer. So I'll play here the beginning of J.S. Box Fugue, number 13 in F sharp major from the Well-Tempered Clavier. Um, I chose this one because it has a little bit of a key relationship to the section we were just talking about, but also because the subject is slightly similar to the Brahms subject. So that sounds like this. Here's the subject. And then that last note of the subject is also the first note of the answer, which sounds like this. and the answer continues. So what's interesting is the answer is not exactly the same as the subject. The subject starts out with a musical interval of a fourth, and we could just count that up in scale degrees. One, two, three, plus one, two, three, four. So if the answer also used a fourth, it would sound like this. But it doesn't. The answer uses an interval that's one step larger, a fifth. So we can count that up in the scale. One, two, three, not four, but five. So my main point is we can tell these two different forms apart. So the first thing we hear is the subject that starts with a fourth. Then we hear the answer that starts with a fifth. And I'll play also the uh, accompaniment part that continues above the answer.
and so on. And the reason fugues often begin this way, if you combine these two versions of the subject together, you hear um, it sort of outlines the key. So it helps to clarify what key the piece is going to be in. That's the reason for that technique. Right. And when we hear them together is exactly at that moment, at the beginning of the recap, when the, introdu when the introduction comes back in the drastically wrong key. So here, Brahms is using the subject and the answer uh, forms of this motive, but he's using them to define the key that is, we've sort of gotten a little bit lost on the way home and taken a wrong turn. Uh, so here, uh, this works actually just the opposite of the Brahms. The subject form starts with a fifth. And then the answer form, two things are different about it. One is that it starts with a fourth. that they overlap. Normally, we don't hear the answer until the end of this subject. But here, the answer comes in on the third, uh, sorry, on the third note of the subject. This is called a stretto, and it just contributes to the sense of agitation, that there are a lot of overlapping things going on here. Uh, so that sounds like this. So we hear. And then at that same time. So they just kind of spill uh, one, onto, one into another. Now, what's interesting about the way these are arranged, this makes sense. We have subject form and then answer form. Yeah, they're, they're in the wrong key, and they're squished together a little bit. But uh, what's also uh, strange about this is that this is not the form of the motive that we heard at the beginning of the piece. The form that we heard at the beginning of the piece uh, looks like the second form of the motive here that I've labeled the answer that begins with a fourth. And just to remind you. So it's as if here we have the answer form without the subject. We're answering a statement that hasn't been uttered yet. It's almost like the piece is a little out of balance. If you have an answer, there really should have been a subject and an answer together. That would tell us we're really in F minor. But Brahms wants at the beginning of this piece I can't speak for Brahms. One imagines that Brahms wanted the effect of the piece being only sort of an F minor, problematically an F minor, an F minor that needs to fix itself or assert itself more clearly over the course of the piece. So we're really longing at some point to hear subject and followed by answer in F minor. Which finally does happen in the very last measures of the piece. So uh, as you can see, this is the very end of the piece, the coda. Here's the last bar of the first movement. Uh, and so finally, we get the subject, the form that begins with a fifth in the piano. And then that's followed by the answer form in the viola. The one that begins with a fourth is in the viola. And you'll notice there are none, none of the problematic G flats anywhere around here. That We've kind of solved the G flat problem by this point. Good point. In fact. This chord features a G natural, so everything right has been reconciled to F minor. And that sounds like this. curious about hearing this at the very end of the piece is uh, normally if this were a real fugue, that would be precisely what comes at the beginning of the piece. So this is a piece that goes from haziness, from ambiguity toward a kind of clarity, um, quite different from the Baroque procedure where there's a clarity of key established in the very opening bars. Now, when Brahms alludes to fugue, he's also alluding to his hero, J.S. Bach. Uh, Brahms said about Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, the most famous collection of uh, fugues in every key, he said, with this, I rinse my mouth every morning. He felt this was what one should really, <laughs> just like that, this is really what one should aspire to. Now, we know that in the 19th century, composers were increasingly interested in the idea of music and its history, in the idea of uh, the composer as a genius, uh, the greatest compositions as masterworks. 
Um, some might say that the iconic uh, revival of Bach's uh, St. Matthew Passion was sort of the beginning of this project of canon formation. So when Brahms, toward the end of his life, is alluding to Bach, he's also alluding to this idea of the kind of iconic, quintessential, perfect German composer. Um, um, that he sort of wanted to engage these techniques, but also allude to that tradition, a tradition that perhaps he saw as fragile, as uh, dying off, that he might be the last in this line of German composers was something that gave Brahms anxiety toward the end of his life. And perhaps that anxiety is somehow wrapped up in this piece, or with the idea of F minor being fragile. Maybe tonality was itself fragile. He's writing in the last years of the 19th century. Uh, so maybe that, there's some of that resonance in this as well. Um, besides the subject and answer, there are other techniques throughout the piece that allude to fugal technique. We've already mentioned one of them. We mentioned this canon that comes in the closing theme, canon being closely related to fugue, and canon is another technique that uh, Bach excelled in. And there's another example. Um, we mentioned this agitato theme, which goes... So when the agitato theme first comes, each statement of that agitato idea fits in one bar. But then Nicole wants to intensify that theme, sort of put that theme writ large with double note values so that it takes up two bars. This is a technique called augmentation, and it's a t technique very commonly used in fugues. So let's play this whole section, and you'll hear us. Um, uh, you'll hear should us. I play, shouldn't I play these alone? Oh, sure. First. Please. Yeah, so I get to play. Uh, yeah. So it's sort of the expanded version of that motive and that theme. And when you put them together, here's what they sound like side by side. We're in bar 57? Yeah. OK. Good. <laughs> another passage that is alluding to these uh, traditions that grow out of fugue, grow out of counterpoint, grow out of the Baroque, and therefore referring to J.S. Bach. So we've talked about analysis. Um, we want to suggest the idea that maybe what music theorists do when we take a piece apart is not so different from what performers do when they rehearse, where they also take a piece apart. What are the different elements? How do they relate to each other? Um, what idea here leads to that idea there? The piano introduces something. How does the viola respond to it? Um, this note here maybe anticipates that harmony there. Um, that's very much like what performers do when they rehearse pieces. And that suggests that um, analysis is like a kind of a rehearsal, or a rehearsal is like a kind of analysis. And what brings them together then is when we've analyzed the piece, taken you through our process, and then perform it together. It's very hard to say, we did this analysis in this measure, and therefore I play it exactly that way. But I would suggest that I want to hear performances by performers who've thought about the notes they're playing, and that somehow there's some relationship between this process of analysis and things that might be palpable in our performance. So um, we'll perform the movement for you now, and uh, afterward we'll love to hear your thoughts, your reflections, or any questions you have to, to share with us about the piece. So hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. 
would love to hear your thoughts, reflections, questions, comments. Uh, there's a microphone coming around. Counter arguments. <laughs> Dissents. Uh, I'm a cellist um, and have played, of course, the Brahms sonatas and, uh, and uh, always value the conversation that goes on in rehearsal. Um, but I'm not a theorist. Not, I don't have the skills and tools that you both have. Do you disagree ever on, how, on your analysis? Hmm. So, so far, not really. <laughs> but, but this is the first thing we've played together. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this is a piece that we've both used a lot in our classrooms. Um, it's a piece that I've been playing for many years and I've been studying quite a bit. And when we first came together a couple weeks ago to start rehearsing it, we were um, surprised to learn how many of the same details interested both of us, and we'd found them sort of independently. Uh, there are pieces of music where there are ambiguities written into them that are hard to resolve. Uh, is this note part of the chord, or is that note part of the chord? And this is the sort of thing music theorists deal with all the time. Uh, and sometimes that can suggest different ways of playing things um, in a way that brings out one of the analytical interpretations or the other. And when that is the case, I think it says something about the music, that it admits of multiple interpretations. So that's a score rich enough to um, give us moments to ponder over. Uh, but I, I don't think one needs a PhD in music theory to do analysis. Because analysis takes many forms. As soon as we're asking what key are we in here and where does it start to move? Um, this theme, does it have some notes or intervals in common with that other theme? The character of this section is this, but the character of that section is that. When I arrive here, it doesn't feel totally final. All of those are analytical statements, whether they're backed up with music theory language, the type we would use in journals or not, um, statements performers use all the time are analysis. And I think music theorists have a lot to learn from the kinds of language performers use in their rehearsal rooms. But I think often we are talking about the same thing in different kinds of language. So because we're music theorists, I think it allows us to say, well, I think it should go like this, and here's why, because look at these relationships of these notes. So I imagine if we did disagree, we'd be able to articulate our reasons, and probably one of us would talk the other in would, would talk the other into the reading. We would be able to agree on it. Yeah, training in music theory gives you a vocabulary. So that's why all along the way we peppered this with, and here's the term for that thing. But the term is less important than hearing the thing. You know, it doesn't matter if we call it second species. What matters is, oh, that motive in the bass came from the opening. I think any performer should be interested to notice that or have that pointed out to them. Um, but is there a therefore? Is it, you know, this motive came from the opening, therefore it must be played in this way? That I'm much less confident about. Um, but I mean, imagine a performer, uh, an actor or actress performing in a play. We think at a minimum they should understand the language the play is in. They should have some sense of the dramatic arc, the style of this playwright versus that playwright. If they're saying a word that's part of a motif that comes throughout the play, these are things that are incumbent on that actor to be sensitive to as they prepare their part. Uh, I think that's pretty similar to the kind of analysis that musicians can and I would encourage them to do in their rehearsal rooms, in their coachings. But I think it always doesn't, as, as you just said, if I could reinforce that point, it doesn't always have to come down to being able to analyze it to say why it should be this way. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things my yoga teacher says to me all the time is let your body be the teacher. Yeah. And I think to some extent, also you need to let the music be your teacher. And so there were, we, I mean, we talked over a lot of material in this piece. Uh, and there were some things that did admit of, oh, should this be faster because this, or slower because of this, or things that we did have uh, kind of two ideas about how it should go, and we just said, let's, let's see how it goes once in the performance. We'll just let the music carry it through just however we end up feeling it. Occasionally, analysis does give me ideas that I can take tangibly into performance. I have an idea for an example, if you could indulge me with playing the first four measures of the second movement. Oh, yeah, sure. I would love to play. The so the, this piece is in four movements. Here's how the second movement, the slow movement, begins. It's in A flat major. So after the storm of the first movement, it's a much calmer, more tranquil second movement. It starts this way. You'll notice 
notice I basically played a scale. E flat, B flat, C. If you remember how the first movement ended, those same three notes, E flat, B flat, C, end the first movement and open the melody of the next movement, reharmonized in a new key. And once I noticed that, I realized these two movements probably should be played almost a taka so that I can share the idea that the story's not over at the end of the first movement, but it segues into the next movement. Um, the end of the second movement ends this way. Can we do the last four bars? Sure. Uh, la sorry, from 75? Here, you mean, yeah. 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 <sighs> This note that I'm playing now in A flat is the note the next moment starts on. And that suggests to me again, Brahms is inviting me to play a taka without a break from movement two to movement three. Yet another thing, um, the first movement ended with C, C, C. Second movement, C, C, C. The theme of the fourth movement, the triumphant fourth movement is F, F, F. So sometimes you begin to notice these links and they suggest to me that maybe there shouldn't be too much break. Maybe I should play all four movements and not just one if we had enough time. And it, it just, it's fun for me as a story we can trace over the course of the whole. It is what makes these movements belong together as one sonata. And as a performer, I'd like to know that. Even if I can't articulate exactly what I do as a result of it. It's um, for me part of it getting to know the piece the same way you'd want to get to know a, a person who becomes your friend. And just like getting to know a person, they turn out to be weirder than you thought they were. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and they don't reveal all their secrets at first. Right. Hi, thanks for a great talk and performance. I've got a question for you, Ed. Um, since this was originally written for clarinet, one of the main features of any wind instrument is that you have to breathe. Yes. You have to find places to breathe. And I'm sure that there's no one set of places where a clarinetist decides to breathe, but it has to happen. It doesn't quite have to happen with the viola. And I'm wondering if you're very conscious of where the breathing is taking place in the clarinet version and whether that informs what you may do or what you might try alternatively uh, on a string instrument? That's a terrific question. You know, sometimes, to speak more generally and then about this piece, sometimes something about the physicality of your instrument tells you a lot about how to play the piece. Uh, but sometimes thinking away from your instrument, um, so I recommend to my viola students, put the instrument down and sing. Uh, because, of course, anytime we're playing a melody, we're really imitating singing. And as you say, um, on wind instruments, their playing is, a, is in some ways much closer to singing because it involves breathing. And the finiteness of the amount of air they have um, is a guide for their tempo, for their phrasing, for their expression. If we could invent a machine that could play the clarinet or the flute or the oboe without breathing, it would not be more musical than human beings because that, that, that constraint of the breath is actually what enables us to play lyrically. So I think any melody we're playing, we should think about where we'd sing, how much air, and the bow, spending bow is a lot like spending air. Um, I don't totally agree that it's a non-issue on the viola. There's certain notes toward the end of the piece. I really feel the finiteness of my bow on that long note and I'm playing in a high register so there's more intensity. I think that's a lot like singing or playing an instrument in a high register. Um, I think any viola studying these pieces should really get to know the clarinet versions. Uh, Brahms, mainly his adjustments consist of taking things an octave lower where he thought they'd be more playable by amateur <coughs> violas playing at home. That was really the market for this as a composition. So then the question is posed, well, if nowadays we can play as high as clarinetists can, should we restore the registers Brahms originally composed? And some violists do. I have in the past. This performance today, I played the viola version. Um, 
We know Brahms wasn't thrilled with the things he took down an octave and the adjustments he made. Uh, he described the transcription as, quote, um, awkward and clumsy. We also know <laughs> he wrote a letter to Mivfeld, the clarinetist he wrote them for, saying, will you please, please, please play with me at this concert? Otherwise, I shall be forced to ask a violist. <laughs> but that also means he didn't want to ask another clarinetist. So I think it's a, a specific musician, a specific friend he wrote the piece for, and that that was part of his conception. There are so many passages in this piece that are so clearly conceived for the clarinet. All of this, um, all this stuff where you go low and then high very quickly on a um, string instrument. That's to get from low position to high position, from low string to high string on clarinet. It's sort of all in one place. So I, I would be a very happy camper if I could find a way to sound more like a clarinetist or play this piece as naturally as it fits on the clarinet. Brahms was very concerned, not so much in his piano writing, but his writing for other instruments, that his music be idiomatic for those instruments. He wrote a letter to the violinist um, Josef Joachim saying, I enclose herein, I think it was my A minor string quartet, could you just go through the parts and change a few notes for me? Because whenever I see fingerings written in, that's a sign that there's something wrong in the part writing. It's an interesting idea that um, the constraints of what feels good for a performer on a particular instrument should be something to be taken into consideration or the piece should be composed well for that instrument. I think Brahms thought about that for every instrument except the piano, where he wrote some quite difficult, quite, quite <laughs> a lot of challenges to negotiate in piano music by Brahms. Right, I don't have enough places to breathe, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it matters less, really, because the piano is fundamentally a percussion instrument. I mean, you're hitting the strings. It doesn't really have sustain the way that you do. At the same time, my piano teacher said the same thing to me. You should be able to sing this, uh, not just play it. But I think I didn't really become aware of how percussive the piano was until I started playing organ, which the note never decays. The note never, you know, this note I'll play and eventually it will go away. But if I were playing this note on an organ, I, I, could, I would play Hold it. forever. It. Yeah, exactly, until I have a heart attack or the church burns down or whatever. Power goes out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kingdom come. So, so it makes a big difference. But I like the idea of just having to sing the line. This is something that's used a lot in jazz pedagogy as well, not just when you're playing the tune, but uh, beginning jazz soloists tend to want to impress and be virtuosic and fill the available space with as many notes as possible. And so very often the teachers will say, you need to be able to sing that because it will do really kind of the same thing, force them mm -hmm. to have to take a breath and leave the music some space. That's not just our idea. I think C.P. Bach, uh, among yeah, many lots, other lots people, of people have, have had this idea. <laughs> singing is a good idea for instrumentalists. I think we have another question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, for the lecture and for the, the performance. I would like to ask two questions. The first one is a bit weird. What is the lowest note that the clarinet or the viola plays in the piece? And from which I'll ask my second question. The lowest note. Is um, it the lowest note of the, the, the clarinet? Hmm. I would need to check that. I haven't thought about that. In general, I don't think anything low was taken out of the viola part when this was transcribed. It was more things that are high that were right. taken down an octave. But right. um, I should mention the other of these two sonatas, the E-flat sonata, Brahms, being dissatisfied with the viola version, also made a violin version. And in that case, high is no problem, but low is a problem. It doesn't go low enough. And so he actually had to rewrite the piano part and gave some of the low notes well, to the piano. That, that would have been the, the nature of my question here, because it seems to me that the viola and the clarinet are what could be called two different color realities or uh -huh. two different timbral realities. And that though they may share something in the lower registers where one might say they're plaintive in some way, uh, they, they, don't, they don't share the same qualities timbrally in the upper registers. So I'm always puzzled when people do that, be it Brahms or any other composer, is I would have thought, like the practice in vocal music, that you make a transposition of the work to actually fit the timbral reality of yeah. the voice that you're going to be using. So a soprano version, a tenor version, a baritone version, a right. alto version. So my argument would have been that the, the error, if you wish, uh, is that Brahms should have transposed down for the viola. He Brahms should have made a, a transposition of a whole step or a minor third or something like that. That's why I asked you about the lowest note in yeah, the piece. That's a great point. Brahms, uh, when he transcribed his G major violin sonata for cello, 
he did just that. He transposed it down a fifth so that if you know, the cello's five, four strings are one fifth lower than the violins, and so when the cello's playing it's something that's supposed to be in the violin's high register, it's in the cello's high register. Um, I think Brahms didn't invest as much energy in this transcription. I showed you that particular <laughs> page on the screen, and a copyist wrote it out, and he seems very quickly to have made a couple of markings, up an octave, down an octave, and the reason is commercial. This music was written for people to buy to play at home, and there's a lot of violinists slash violists around, and not so many clarinetists. Um, but he didn't really consider this uh, the true version of the piece. I feel so strongly that these are clarinet sonatas, and we violas should be doing our best to master the clarinet um, ethos as best we can. That maybe means making a um, mellower sound than sometimes we do. And the problem, just as you mentioned, if we play some things in the clarinet register, the clarinet maintains its mellowness in the high register, whereas the viola gets quite bright. So if I play... Um, versus maybe bringing it down an octave means I'm not in the same octave as the clarinet was, but I have that mellow quality, whereas the viola on the A string can sound sort of strident. So we're, we're making compromises. The other thing I'll mention is before Brahms even thought about viola with this piece, he went back and forth about the register for the opening. Um, in the clarinet version, the exposition starts there, and the recap starts there. But Brahms went back and forth about which one should be up, which one should be down. It's one of the rare scores where we have Brahms' early versions that he crossed out. So he seems to have gone back and forth about register even within his work on the clarinet version, probably workshopping it with Milfeld, what one might imagine. To answer your first question, it looks like the clarinet part goes down to D below middle C. <laughs> so I, I can do that. Yeah, you have that too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Is this on? Hello? Can you hear it? I think we hear you. Oh, you can hear it, okay. Um, great, this is a really wonderful and entertaining and informative. And I'm, I don't have words for performers or words for music theorists, but I have some psychologist words. And uh, one of the things that fascinates me is this mystery, troubling, G-flat, and the various kinds of things that are going on, ambiguous ambiguities in tonality, where we are, and what key are we in, and things like that. And it seems to me one thing that Brahms does a lot is he sets up expectations and then foils them in some way, so you keep you on your toes in a certain sense. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how this playing with expectations is part of the sort of the lived experience of trying to figure out where you're going and the sense of fulfillment or waiting for something to fulfill and then delaying expectations and so on and so forth as a kind of formal experience. That's certainly something that's a big part of life is patterns in our lives that establish expectations and then a kind of trajectory in life whereby they're either fulfilled in the way we thought they were or not and that can be disappointing or surprising and that can be part of the storytelling. I think a lot of places in this piece, Brahms kind of half fulfills the expectations, right? Like bringing the introduction back, but in the wrong key. One direction we didn't go in this talk was to talk too much about rhythmic and metric things, but that's what I do, so I'm very aware of them. And that's another thing that's ambiguous about this introduction is it begins 5-1, yes. but normally that's something that happens upbeat, downbeat. And here, the five is on the downbeat. It's kind of in the wrong place. And so I feel like there's really a lack of metric clarity in the introduction as well as tonal clarity and that's another thing that does get fixed when it comes back so loudly in the wrong key right. at least we're we're sort of where we're supposed to be uh, in terms of the structure of the meter yeah and I mean Brahms is not the only composer to do this there are pieces by Haydn that open with music that should be the ending of the piece the joke quartet is a good example and then they get going and then later on you hear that kind of weird opening used as an ending and ah okay that's where this should have belonged so the idea of having conventions that means those conventions can be manipulated for expressive reasons that's very much a, a, a classical style thing to do because the role of convention in the 18th century was so important Brahms was a composer with one foot in this is metaphor work in the 18th century and one foot worrying about what might happen in the 20th century. So um, <laughs> those, those, those elements could get mixed in, I think, into the composing for sure. Thanks. Any more questions? All right, well, I'd like to thank you both very much for a wonderful Thank you so much.
wish you all a happy American Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All done? Yeah, yes, you too. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>